Good evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera, where we share the fun of the big questions with you. My name is Kim Diaz, and I'm a philosopher here at EPCC. And my name is Jewel Simon, and I'm a philosopher from the University of Texas, El Paso. And today we are so honored to have Dr. Miguel Juarez, who is a first-generation interdisciplinary scholar and contingent faculty member who teaches U.S. history at both the University of Texas at El Paso and El Paso Community College, where he incorporates 3D printing, regional, and urban history. He has published two books, Where Are All the Librarians of Color? And I ask that as a question. The Experiences of People of Color in Academia, co-edited with Rebecca L. Hankins, and Colors on Desert Walls, The Murals of El Paso, with photographs by Cynthia Weber Farah. He is currently a consulting party for the Downtown 10 Project, working to preserve El Paso's African-American, Mexican-American, Native American, and Chinese historical neighborhoods. Dr. Juarez is also an advocate for the Valverde Neighborhood Association in South Central El Paso. And you can find out more about his extensive research and work in our community in the description of our video below. Dr. Juarez, so happy to have you here. Well, thank you for this invitation. And we're, look, well, yeah, we're very much looking forward to dialoguing with you. How would you define history? What is history for you? History is research via uh, stories based on evidence based on evidence. Um, it's not about making up history. It's not your opinion so much. But you do sometimes have to read into the sources, especially if you're limited to certain sources. So you have to read into the sources and find out what is not being said. What is not being said, what is not in the sources. So you have to use your training in history to kind of ask questions, what's not being said, uh, what's not being mentioned, what's not here. So it's basically, it's evidence-based research, but of course, since uh, some topics are not, don't have, uh, or if you can't find the archives, then you have to fill in. Yeah, how, how does that happen? The second question we have on our list is, why is it important to study history? So. It's important to look in. How do you how do you dive into or, or look for these alternative or hidden sources? Well, I think archivists are a big uh, help because archivists work with the materials. They uh, process materials, which they uh, impose intellectual order to them. Ah, okay. So so either they do them chronologically or how the collection comes in or they themselves order it in a way with scholars in mind. So scholars can find it and then they put it on a, what's called a finding guide. And then the finding guide gets put up on the, on the web, on the internet. So when, usually when someone's searching for, for information, they go to like Google, right? Let's see what Google knows. And scholars do the same thing to a certain extent. Let's see, let's see where this collection is. And up will pop up uh, a finding guide that's been put on the web and then you know, oh, it's in this collection at UT Austin, it's at UCLA or whatever. So scholars then apply for a funding or they pay their way there. Usually they apply for funding to get there. So you can sit there with a box of materials depending on how large the collection is. The collection should be, could be just a folder mm -hmm. or it could be hundreds of boxes. So you basically just sit there and you look at each folder for the area that you're interested in and you start reading and then you start finding out things that that are maybe have not been researched before or uh but then also before that of course you have to do you have to do you have to do a proposal to the funding entity and hopefully by then you have researched the topic in secondary sources but maybe not in primary sources and some of the books have primary sources. So you can basically create that history using secondary sources, others that have published on the topic, mm. and, um, but they've left out things that you wanna research. 
and then also research in the primary documents. Oral histories are primary sources. Uh, and you try to find out as much information on the topic, uh, including a list of books and magazines and articles, newspapers, and so forth, before you go to the archive. Mm -hmm. That's but that's not always the case, you know. It's sometimes you, you do a little bit of everything at the same time. Yeah, sometimes it's just looking through all these old letters, yes. right, or something like yes. that. Yes, right. Yes, and, and trying to analyze what are they saying and what are they not saying. Mm. Because I think there's still a lot of history that remains uh, to be told because it's untold. And you yourself as a historian, uh, if you're interested in a specific area, you want to see, like in, like in my research, um, the people who built El Paso freeways, most of them are gone. Mm. Uh, but I'm sure they left papers. They left papers with their family. Also finding out who knows them. Who knows them so I, uh, I could be introduced and I could introduce myself and they could know that I'm not out to, I'm out to basically tell the history based on whatever papers they have. And so it's like a dance. You kind of have to, you kind of have to find the materials, get access to them and find time to sit down and read, uh, read the materials in the collection. What got you interested in doing that? The sitting down and reading and digging like that, you know, how, well, because it's a, it's a different yes. way, kind of different way than practicing history art. An archivalist yes, yes, you know, well, has I to actually, get his, his or her hands on stuff. Well, actually, I have the good fortune of uh, years ago, when the internet first came to El Paso, which was in the in the mid '90s, through the Rio Grande Fern, uh, uh, Rio Grande Freenet, there was a professor here named Don Firth. I knew Don Firth because uh, he was part of a committee that David Crowder put together of people who were looking kind of linked to the future, the future of El Paso, and I was part of the committee. I met Don Firth. Don Firth. I just kept talking about the the internet that it was coming and people didn't know what it was. And so and then he established the Rio Grande Free Net. Mm -hmm. Don Firth and I'm sure he got awards back then. He deserves to be recognized and remembered for all his work that he did uh introducing the internet to El Paso. Mm -hmm. And so uh through the internet uh, actually, a friend of mine sold me her $10 modem and I connected it to my Mac Performa. I taught myself how to do Pine. And I went to Juan Sandoval and I said, Juan Sandoval used to be a librarian at UTEP. I knew I him. Remember. I went up to Juan and I said, Juan, what kind of job can I get using the internet so I could look things up for people or whatever? And he says, that's a librarian, Miguel. Uh, and at the time, I was thinking University of Arizona had a program, the Knowledge River. And so uh, then I joined listservs. One of the listservs that I joined was Chicle. Chicle was a listserv. I don't even remember a listserv named Chicle. Chicle was a listserv created by Teresa Marquez, a graduate of Bowie High School that was in one of the first library science programs at Cal State Fullerton's when they were looking for uh, persons of color to go into the field. So she was in this, one of the first programs, she became a librarian. She ended up at UNM and she created the first Chicana Humanities Listserv. What's a Listserv, you know, especially if you weren't on the internet. And she went around and she went to uh, conferences with faculty and at first they ignored her, but then they eventually uh, were starting hearing about the internet. It's like, it's like, it's like chat GPT, right? We didn't know about it a year ago and now everyone's talking about it. Well, the internet was the same way. People like Don Firth and Teresa Marquez. And so on, so I subscribed to all these listeners and I was getting all this information. I've always, I've always wanted to look at the big picture as opposed to just, you know, something small. And on one of those listservs, they were looking for people to apply to go to SUNY Buffalo to get a uh, focus on academic librarianship. And I said, that's what I want to do. I applied. 
I was accepted, and by that time, in 1997, my book came out. So I showed my book on the screen, <laughs> and so use everything, right? And so, so I I got one of those fellowships, and I went because I felt that was really so. I have I've worked in the archives and the field, so I know what's out there. And I have friends who work at other universities who I borrowed materials from, books even that were impossible to, uh, to, uh, to check out. I checked it out, you know, through my friend or whatever. So, so, and I know the field and I know how it operates and there is so much that has yet to be researched. Like there's so much in El Paso that has yet to be researched. And it's just, uh, I just know that my time is limited and uh, I just need to choose certain things I want to do, and that's going to be it. And then hopefully it will inspire the next generation of people. But as we know, you know, in the humanities, less and less people are going into the humanities mm. because they're saying it doesn't pay. It doesn't pay. They'd rather be therapists than something else that's going to give them a good job. And, you know, something in El Paso, why... I think uh, places like community college and UTEP need to step it up in terms of recruitment so that people come here versus going to maybe a quick two-year program that's going to get them a job as a, uh, you know. Radiologist. Some radiology. Radiology. Because I think uh, once you start, if parents start going to school, their, their kids see them. So they model that behavior, and yes, you could probably you know go and get a job and all that, but you shouldn't stop there. You need to continue. And so I think, uh, especially community college uh, and UTEP, they really need to, they need to not think of themselves so much as a four-year institution and all that, and what's next after that. But there needs to be a, a more concentrated effort to kind of, uh, tell them we're looking at the bigger picture here and at the future. Uh, it's not just about right now, today. And in the future, this, this is a world that you're going to inherit. And without doing that, I think uh, recruiting needs to be innovative and, and cutting edge, and you need to have fun with it too. They need to know that education is fun. That's, that's why we have our TV show. <laughs> we have fun with the big questions in life. Yes. yes. Right. I want to I ask you, go deeper into this. Why is it important to study history? It's important to study history. You know, you hear that adage, or you're, if you don't study history, you're bound to repeat it. That's what everybody says all the time. But history, history, is, history is alive and well in El Paso, and there's so many stories that have not been told. Um, I think I, give, I got involved in history because I come from a communications major in college, creative writing, um, art, fine art. And at some point, actually, when I came back to town, I was deci I deciding, should I get my PhD in rhetoric or should I get my PhD in history? And, and I had already uh, gone to talk to a faculty member in rhetoric, but I couldn't put my head around rhetoric. How am I going to help the community with rhetoric? I mean, you know, history, I know that people are hungry for their stories that have never been told. Uh, we've had past historians like the late Leon Metz who would tell history, but again, he would focus on only a particular group of people. That was the history that he knew and he loved. He also had the great opportunity to work in the special collections at UTEP where he was surrounded by all these materials. We don't have another deficit in El Paso like other Texas cities, other cities around the country. We do not have a community archive. Mm. Uh, there are collections at the El Paso Public Library, but since they're building, they're retrofitting the building to put the Mexican American Cultural Center there, the collection is now the Cesio Troncoso branch but not part, not all of it. So there's nothing like being able to go to an archive and have everything available for you where you could say, I want to see this box. You see something in a box and you say, well, I want to see this other box in another collection. And we don't have that luxury here. 
there's not a community archive where where are all the archives from La Mujer Obrera? Where are all the archives from the farm workers? Mm -hmm. Where are the archives from all the different groups that you'd be interested in? Where are they? Where are women's voices? Where are Latina women's voices? And even, even, even programs like this, at some point, they need to be digitized and searchable. So a scholar's looking for, they find this program, and they're looking, say, say you know, 100 years from now, was Miguel Juarez, he was all over the place. And you know, we, we heard the stories like so-and-so was all over the place in Europe and whatever. And so uh, we do know he was on this philosophy program, but how do we get access to it? How do we search it? Is it searchable? Those are the questions they're gonna be asking. So these shows are important, these programs are important, but in the future they need to be searchable. That's what, uh, that's what universities right now um, I get a lot of uh, petitions sent to me or whatever because, you know, I have that background. And they're creating discovery, discovery positions because universities have uh, realized if their collections are not used, they're going to be extinct. So uh, discovery is a big word. Discovery means going out and educating people that we have these things because they don't know we have them. That's um, good. What do you think is the frontera between philosophy and history? Philosophy is basically the, um, the kind of, um, the history of ideas, right? The history of ideas and the rhetoric of ideas. Uh, the frontera is, uh, and, and, and there is a history of philosophy as well, you know, and, yeah. uh, and so. And then philosophy, have, a lot of it is historical, right? We yes. study the history. I think. How, but I, we're different disciplines. Yes. So. Uh, it's, they're different disciplines, but they're very closely related. They're very closely related. I think there needs to be more work be, uh, to combine uh, both uh, disciplines because they're very much alike. Mm -hmm. Language, language is a big part of it. So, and uh, it's it's a border that needs to be crossed and recrossed over and over. Yeah, we've been transgressing it regularly. <laughs> <laughs> Can we trust historical accounts, right? And earlier you mentioned is the facts. And as a philosophers like to keep asking questions. And so just because it says this the facts, I'm still, yeah, right, but by who, who's saying that, right? For instance, the history of the American continent is told differently by Europeans and American Indians or African Americans, right? And just like you said earlier, this gentleman who had access to the special collections at UTEP told a certain history, his history, but it may not be Right. Our history, your history. Yes, yes. Well, m he maybe did not include items that he disagreed with. So, and uh, historians do that, but sometimes you have to include those things that you disagree with. That's what historians uh, are supposed to do. They're supposed to be as objective as they can. And I know one of the question, one of your questions, could be, how objective can history be? It needs to be, of course, evidence based. But if the sources are not there, then you have to insert yourself what you know of the subject area and see how other scholars have treated that subject or that area. So you need to find what other scholars have written about uh, that topic that you either can't find information or that you disagree with to get other perspectives uh, as seen by uh, basically how they're visioning this history. So, I'm going to ask a related question, and it, I think it, hopefully it gets right at some of the work you've done in the past. So, one one of the areas I work in is philosophy of history, mm. and and I and I technically belong in the field called history of philosophy. So I yes. study the yes. how philosophical ideas have evolved over time and things like that. But um, this question about how objective history can be or historians can be is, is really significant because it determines then distribution of resources and political, uh, you know, political divisions and things like that. So in your work, you worked 
you've worked on the history of El Paso. Yes. And so why is it, this is not quite on this, this is on, is on, it's not on this list, but perhaps it's in between the lines, right? Why is it important to focus on the murals of El Paso as a way to tell the history of El Paso? Well, you know, the murals of El Paso, uh, usually when an artist is creating a mural, mm, some artists um, are mandated to work with the community. And some do and some don't. But they also research. They research the images. They re research the personalities they want to include in the mural, the history. And so it's basically history depicted in uh, 2D form in the mural and then color and so forth. And so, and there's a whole world uh, and dates and personalities and styles in art and in the regional art in El Paso. And, and murals are like an explosion of that mm -hmm. on a wall. Present day, we have the younger muralists that are doing very innovative work and very different than the muralists of the past. Like comparing like uh, the guy that does the airbrush balloons, mm -hmm. uh, if you compare that to Tom Lee, it's still, they're still murals, but they're very different. Tom Lee was based on the kind of history of, uh, of the region and in his famous mural, uh, Pass of the North at the Federal Building, he had people pose for those parts, but he was coming from a very different place than some of the newer muralists, but it's still muralism. Muralism is a very exciting topic for a lot of people. Uh, there's also spray can art uh, or spray can murals, aerosol right. murals, a lot of the younger people are doing that. There's also graffiti type of murals. Mm -hmm. It's just a very dynamic, exciting art expression of its own. Uh, and young people lo love it because, and then historians like it as well because there's so much that you can include. You can include historical figures, periods, and so forth. And it's very much alive. We still see it. We still see it, muralism being produced in communities, in a rec center, out on the street, uh, in, in larger installations and so forth. So, so it's still a, a vibrant uh, art form that we still have today. And it's important. It's important to the community. So. Yeah. We have a question later on, like what's your favorite historical person or the favorite historical period or something like that. But maybe you could share with us at this point and then we'll get back to our list. Do you have a story about a favorite mural that you could share with us? Wow, a story of a favorite mural. Mm. Or a distinctive one or something um, that stands out. I think uh, there's a mural by Mago, the late Mago Orona Gandara. She painted a mural called La Niña Cosmica, the cosmic girl, I guess. Right, yeah. And uh, Mago did not use paint, she used mosaic. She would get pieces of glass oh, wow. and break them, mm -hmm. and then she would uh, do the design, and then based on where she was going to put that color, she would stick that. Mm -hmm. So it was like a tedious, time-consuming work. Well, Mago was looking for a wall to put that, and uh, she got many suggestions. People told her, oh, you could put it off the freeway. Imagine when people would zoom by, they would see it or whatever. But the wall that she found was a wall atop the uh, children's cafeteria at, I think it was uh, at an elementary school where she did this installation. And I asked her, Mago, why did you, uh, why did you put the mural there and no one can see it? Uh -huh. No one can see it. Uh, people, the, you, people passing by the street can't see it. People passing through El Paso cannot see it. And she says, she, she, she told me in an interview, I put it there so the children can see it. Mm -hmm. that go in the cafeteria every day so they can see something beautiful in their lives. Oh, how because wonderful. Because they may not have that beauty in their lives. Oh, how wonderful. That's a great story. And it was like, you know, yes, you know, it, it's in its place. So 
And Margot was really a stickler for that detail. And she... Uh, Affecting generations of young right, minds. Right, generations. And Margot is the same muralist who did the mural here at uh, uh, Valle Verde, Time and Sand. Okay. That mural was done over several years when they had, when EPCC was located at the huts, the Fort Bliss mm -hmm. on Dyer. Her classes would do uh, a piece of that mural until it was installed with the, in the opening of the Valle Verde campus. But no one really talks about that mural. It's mm. just there since they go, it's always been there, whatever it is, but they don't know that who Mago was and maybe there should be a picture of her or a video mm. of them making it, mm. which exists somewhere. And uh, so uh, I have an interview with her as part of that uh, Frontera Artist Series okay. where she talks about it. So. That would be a good project. Yeah, yes. somebody, somebody could mount that uh, companion tell us, piece. Tell us a little bit more about the Frontera Artist Series. Uh, in 1997, I was uh, part of a group, or in 1996, 1997, with the late Robbie Jean Farley. She had Robbie's friends, and they used to get together at uh, in in a restaurant. And I started going. I was friends with Robbie, and there. I met the general director of uh, EPCC TV. I think his name was Danny Mata, if I'm not mistaken. Well, anyway, and so I thought uh, in 1997, I just published the book Colors on Desert Was the Murals of El Paso, but I lam lamented the fact that there were no pictures of the muralist. Mm -hmm. And we don't really hear the voices either. The, well, we, there are oral history interviews in the book, but I think the artist had more to say. So I proposed to Danny that if we, I could do a series called Frontera Artists, uh, Mexican and Mexican-American uh, artists in El Paso. And we, it was in the studio. It was co-produced by Gabriel de Gaitan. And I interviewed the artists that I knew. And I would, uh, Mago, Mago was very animated when she was speaking. And back then I used to run around with a little hat, with a little fedora hat. And uh, it was, everyone said, where's the hat? They got used to seeing the hat. I go, the hat's gone. It was a very successful, successful show. And I think something like that needs to be recreated again because there's so much happening in, in the arts and uh, it's really important for people to hear from the artists themselves what, why they decided to uh, paint a certain mural. There's a mural painted by Jesus Bando. He, I uh, did the one of the boxers, they're going to have to tear down, yeah. that burn down. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's his baby, you know? Right. And so uh, it'd be great to do an interview with him and to find out, uh, you know, he, he, I'm sure he did drawings, you know. I don't know how he painted it, maybe on ladders. I don't think, I don't know if he had scaffolding, like some mm -hmm. artist, or a hydraulic lift. Right. Like Gabriel Gaitan now uses for the columns. Uh, underneath Lincoln Center, and people help him, he has help. But these artists have been kind of like lone, lone artists out there doing it just on their own, so. Yeah, I saw, I read some uh, article on my news feed, about my social news feed about uh, that mural. Yes. And that there's some debate about. Yes. Should it be torn down and just thrown away, or yes. should it be relocated or something like that? Yes, I, it'd be great for it to be relocated, but the artist is, needs to be involved. Right. needs to be involved and it would be, be a fa fabulous sort of project because it could be re you know uh well maybe it could be on a wall of uh the new mexican american cultural center it could be moved there yeah so you can have like an artifact of a mural that was elsewhere right so yeah. i would like to ask you um for minorities and women let's just say we could say for us here in el paso which, you know, we're, it's interesting, right? Because we're, I forget it with the exact percentage is like 84% Mexican American, right? So technically we're not a minority here in El Paso, but in the rest of the US we are. So for people here in El Paso, minorities and women, how is learning about our history significant beyond studying the traditional Western narrative? 
Well, why is it important for us to learn about our murals and our artists instead of just well, Leonardo da Vinci or? Well, it's important to learn of the lives of the people that have come before us, the artists, the writers, the activists, the change makers, um, the, the parents who had to raise children either by themselves and, and be an activist at the same time and still provide for their children or whatever. So stories are, are edifying. They, they talk about the human spirit and the fact that people have been able to do things in their life at a time and place that the odds were against them big time. And that continues to be the case. And uh, um, we have a lot of brain drain a what lot is of brain drain. Can brain you drain you is uh, people decide to leave, leave El Paso because they say there's nothing here. There's no job for me. And then they leave, they get older, and then they decide to come back. They decide to come back because they miss the familiar. They miss the smells of their mother's cooking or their grandmother's cooking. They miss their family. Uh, when you live outside, like the way I have lived, I was always looking for community always looking for community. Sometimes it was there at Texas A&M, we were talking about it earlier, I met a large group of Latino professors that I hung around with. They invited me to seminar. Hey, did you, do you ever go to seminar? Seminar was what they called. When I first got invited to seminar by Marco Portales, he says, yes, we're gonna have seminar. And I thought, an actual seminar? What are we gonna talk about? So at, at Fitzwillies, Mm -hmm. It was called Seminar at Fitzwillies. So I show up and I bring books and they say, oh, put your books away, have a beer. <laughs> so Seminar was have a beer, have a beer Friday and talk about, and I would learn so much at that seminar, <laughs> much more, and I knew so much because they talked about it, of what mm. had happened in this department or whatever. And that was phenomenal, that was phenomenal. and. Uh, in putting this exhibit together that was called, uh, that I titled Siempre, mm. uh, Hispanics at Texas A&M. Siempre means forever. Hispanics have forever been attending A&M since the late 1800s. One of the first touchdowns was scored by a Mexican-American football player at Texas A&M mm -hmm. in, in, in the late 1800s. And oh. so, so the exhibit, for that exhibit to be called Siempre at a rather conservative mm -hmm. school like Texas A&M, it was breaking ground. It was, you know, breaking ground. And, and the reason that I was able to put that together was because I had these professors that would get together at seminar and at meetings and whatever, and they accepted me into the fold. I found community there. Other places I was not as successful. I had to go, when I was at UNT, I had to go to Dallas. That's where I found community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, they had breakfasts like Freddy's Forum. I don't know if you ever, did you? There used to be a uh, Freddy's breakfast here in El Paso. It started off, Alfredo Corchado's family founded it. And uh, I remember seeing with Moises uh, Bujanda and Alfredo Corchado and we were sitting around uh, having breakfast and someone says, what if we invited the mayor to come and talk to us about whatever? And then we invite other people to come. Well, that started the Freddy's Forum and before you know it, anyone who was anyone would be there to listen in on what was gonna be talked about. Whenever there was someone into town, somehow they would get in touch with them, they'd find out who, who it was and they'd, they'd be speaking at Freddy's Forum. Did the mayor come? The mayor, the mayor, representatives, people who were stumping for office, mm -hmm. uh, filmmakers, writers. It was, it, w it was great, it was great. And that's community, mm -hmm. that's community, which is something uh, that now you have organizations like Community First Coalition that's trying to do more, trying to have El, pa El Paso be a more equitable place. Uh, to live and for business and so forth, and they're uh, really trying. And, uh, and there's other organizations like the people, uh, the Sunrise Group, that are pushing the climate charter. You know, they're trying mm -hmm. to also improve 
El Paso for the, the future. So there's a lot of people trying right now, but that whole period was like, I don't know, it was just, it was just very different, just very different. And so it's, do you think that studying our history will prevent the, the brain drain? I think studying history is important because it will bring people back. The more books that come out on, say, El Paso or the region, uh, people will see at uh, at the airport bookstore and look. There's a there's a book on Freddy's Cafe. Mm -hmm. There's no book on Freddy's Cafe. There's no book on Freddy's Cafe. The sources are there, but no one has put them together. Mm -hmm. Oh look, there's a book on Mago Orona. Uh, someone attempted to do a book, uh, book on Mago Orona, but for the most part, it it does not exist. Or there's a book on La Mujer Obrera, or there's a book on just about every topic uh, that we could think of. Uh, Mario Garcia, Dr. Mario Garcia has done books on Bert Corona, who used to live here. Uh, Ruben Salazar, who used to live here, the journalist mm -hmm. that was shot uh, mm -hmm. during the moratorium, moratorium of the war against Vietnam. There's a story of what happened in El Paso in 1972 when La Raza Unida Convention was held here. Who was involved? and how did they do it? And how did they go uh, row with the flow of events that happened? Uh, there's, no, there's, there's no book, there's no book. I'm sure you know the, I haven't seen the movie, I've only seen clips of Reyes Lopez Tijerina, how he was living in Juarez. Yes. You know, and I, f I wish I could remember the name of the filmmaker. And I haven't seen the movie, I've been wanting to watch it. But uh, like I said, I've only seen clips and it's just like, wow, you know, he was just living in what is just, I mean, right here, you know, right, this whole right, time. Right, I think Clinica La Fe stepped up and they started housing him here in a tenement and they were taking care of him like, like he was a national treasure. Yeah. Right, because he was. So stories like that, we're Wanted missing those stories. Wanted by the law, but also a treasure. Right, you know? right, right. And you know, the story that comes to mind because I just heard her a few days ago, uh, this author that wrote uh, the me her memoir, she uh, teaches here. Her story was when she was 20, she left El Paso. It was like, there's nothing here, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so she was away for, I think, 10 years or so. And she, uh, she felt bad that she was not w uh, closer to her grandmother. She had not come back, she had not come back, and then I think her grandmother died and she felt a lot of remorse of not having been here. The great thing is that people are come back, are coming back. They're coming back educated. They're coming back having kind of grown up, and they're ready to become part of EPCC or part of UTEP or or create a nonprofit or to do something that's going to benefit others, mm -hmm. or or tell their stories or write their memoirs or write their books or do their programs. Uh, and it's very different now because anyone, I, I could do a podcast, I could do a Frontera Artist podcast and all that, but you know, it takes time. Here, doing it as a studio, you have a staff that's supporting you, and it's, I think it's such a luxury uh, to have that. We're very thankful for, right, our, right. for our staff here yeah. at EPCC TV. See, and, and, Thank it, you. and it's great, and it's great, and it's great because if you have to do it on your own uh, podcast, it's a lot of work. And mm -hmm. you just have to kind of, to do a quality podcast, you kind of just have to do that to a certain point. Yeah. So. Do you think that people of color or different ethnicities can learn about their history from white people? In all my classes, I give uh, students like uh, a form that they have to uh, fill out and it's for a grade, so <laughs> it's very great. I call it the bio form. I ask for the names, their phone numbers in case I need to get in touch with them. Because when students register, say if a student is a sophomore, junior or whatever, by the time they're a sophomore, junior or senior, they have a different phone number. Mm -hmm. Because different when they address, register, right. they, their parents bought them a new phone and that phone number is no more. And so anyway, so, and then uh, I ask them, what's, your, what's the last uh, film that you watched? Uh, what's your favorite music? And I asked him a question that uh, I think is non-invasive and I thought a long time. I don't ask him, where are you from? I ask him, where do you call home? Mm -hmm. 
And then some of them say, home is with, with my parents, home is in my bedroom, home is in the city of Houston. And so that, it has many answers, but that gives me a, a lot of insight. And so one of the last questions I ask them, why is it important to study history? Mm. And all sorts of, all sorts of answers, you know. Uh, people refer to that adage, if, if you study history, you know. So, so, and what I used to do in the beginning when I was teaching, I would throw the information back at them anonymously. We would say, we have so many students that are majoring in nursing, this percentage. We have so many women, we have so many men in the course. We have so many people from El Paso. We have two people from Houston. So they get to see who's in the class but not the names aren't there. Mm. And so, uh, and from that, I get a lot of information. So I know who's in the class. I know who's in the class. In one of my current classes, there's uh, someone who's in sports and he's uh, Filipino American. So when I'm talking about black history, and when I'm talking about minorities, I mention Filipino Americans because mm. that's important. That's important. Uh, May Nye writes about it in uh, one book uh, that she writes about the Filipino Americans or the Filipino history in the United States. So it's really important to include those other groups that are often overlooked. And so... Uh, and anecdotally, where would our nursing right. <laughs> groups be without Filipinos? <laughs> right, right, right. So, and you know, uh, so I know uh, who's in the class and so forth, but uh, more important, it gives me information that the students are not gonna give me themselves. Mm. So if, I don't know if a, any other history professors or white history professors do this, they might to a certain level, yeah. but the way that I do it, I know who's in there. So I try to teach to who's in the room, mm. to who's in the room and, uh, I don't know, that, that'd be re a really good conversation to have if uh, white professors are teaching, say, uh, U.S.-Mexico border topics that factor into American history, like the delousing that happened at the border. Mm. Uh, are they showing uh, videos, Vox videos by, uh, that feature David Romo? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, but I show them because I showed that Vox video that uh, they recorded with David Romo. It's a 15 minute video. It's excellently, excellently produced. And I showed it to the students and the students were shocked. They were mm -hmm. like, we didn't know that was happening here. We had David Romo on our show earlier. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The great thing is that UTEP, uh, I feel is one of the best places to study the borderlands at the borderlands. Mm -hmm. Where else are you gonna have that? And so it's producing a lot of history that has never been written uh, or studied before. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's really important to do that. So white professors can teach this if they have read those books, if they have those videos and so forth, and they could have the students even write papers. I have them write papers. I invite also guest speakers to uh, the classes and I have them write uh, papers on what they learned or how they feel and things like that. So uh, yes, I think quiet professors can teach if they're willing to do so. And that's a question I have in, hist in history because in philosophy, in the field of philosophy, even to this day, um, there is a push to study Anglo-European philosophy and Mexican philosophy, Latin American philosophy, Chicano philosophy gets... Um, kind of pushed aside or yeah, down? Yeah, as it's not real philosophy, you know, are you really doing Aztec, you know, the Aztecs? Oh, they, you know, the Mayans, they're not real philosophers. They, they, they did religion, but it's not real philosophy. Is, this, is it the same in history? Or well, well, I think, um, you know, uh, in my classes, I share a lot of the experiences that I've had. I talk to the students about archives, you know, I talk to them that I used to be a librarian and I did this and that. I talk to them about some experiences that I've had 
And uh, it depends who's teaching. It depends who's teaching and if they feel comfortable going there. Some instructors may not feel comfortable going there and they're just going to stick with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, I think in the beginning I felt that I just had to stick to the curriculum and just teach what was in the phoner book or whatever. Right. The phoner book doesn't even uh, mention the Los Angeles Rebellion, which they call the Los Angeles Riots. And why not? Right. Not mention at all. Isn't that a... That's what I'm saying. It was before Black Lives Matter. Why is it not written about? It's important. Uh, and so there are a lot of things that are missing. There are a lot of things that are missing. Uh, there's, there's something on the internet called Black American History. It's a video series done by um, uh, a black professor or someone or someone with a, with a PhD who's written books on on uh, Black America, but there's not one for Latino American history or women's American history. Why not? It takes time. <laughs> Takes well, time, energy, and grants. It no. <laughs> takes it takes that, but it also takes somebody to acknowledge that as history. Yes. Right. That is important, um, and and it's not just in history or in philosophy. I've seen it also in religion. Recently, I've been doing work on religion, and religion still to this day is seen as you know organized with literature with um, institutions, well then that would that would eliminate a lot of other religions that in my eyes are religion, African religions, American Indian religions that are not institutionalized, may not have a literature that, you know, but yes. it's still this, um, if it looks European, <laughs> it's legit and if it doesn't look like what we're used to, then it's not legitimate. So I see the struggle in different areas. But but I think even though maybe they're not taught um, in courses, they're still being practiced in the exactly. community. Exactly. Santeria. Mm -hmm. I know individuals that are into Santeria, the sweat, uh, the, the yes. sweats that they have, mm -hmm. and uh, people are finding a way to practice them, even right. if they're not being taught. Yes. And so they are, they are, even though they're not yes. um, recognized. Yes. Who's your favorite historical figure or historical event and why? Wow. That was that question I <laughs> mentioned earlier. Uh, I think, uh, though I have not uh, read so much of his work, uh, there's, there's this film being, uh, gosh, there's just so much. Uh, Gosh, let me see. I don't know if I have a favorite. Uh, there's a film being promoted. His name is Chevalier, about a person who was, his mother was black and his father was, uh, I think it was a plantation owner. His father basically made sure that he had an education, okay. that he was taught how to fence, that he was taught music, and later on he becomes part of the French resistance. Mm. And he's there when they're beheading people in France, the, the French Revolution. And in the, um, uh, because he even at one point challenges, he becomes a violinist. He goes to a, a, to a hall and, and Mozart is, is, is performing. He steps on stage and he says, uh, can I play, can I play? And Mozart tells him, if you wanna be embarrassed, <laughs> and so they start playing, and after he plays, the crowd gets up and they applaud him. And Mozart turns around and says, who the hell is that? <laughs> so anyway, here's someone, like, uh, throughout history, African Americans have written books, have written books uh, in the 1700s uh, about their experiences and so forth. And here's someone who's very accomplished and living among the elites, although, he doesn't have, he can own land, uh, he can marry certain people and uh, uh, so forth, but he kind of exceeds his standing mm -hmm. in life. 
So I think, I haven't seen the film, so I can't really say he would be like my favorite, but uh, my favorite would be the people who were the uh, various people who were in the abolitionist movement, mm. like the Grimke sisters. The, si the Grimke sisters were uh, sisters who lived in a, planta a plantation in the South. They went up North and they began uh, speaking about uh, the abolition about the abolition of slavery. And in one of those meetings, which was I thought was very ingenious, uh, more and more and more women would start coming to those and fewer and fewer men. And they made the tie from, and they must have just, you know, when, when you lecture, you're talking about something and somehow something pops in your mind and you just say it and after a while you're, you kind of say, well, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but it's, it's already out there, I already said it. And the Grimke sisters tied the abolitionist movement to women's liberation mm. because there were more women in the, in the audience. Mm -hmm. And once they said that, the men in the audience said, oh no, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's never gonna happen. We gotta stop these meetings. <laughs> so, but in one scoop, they just, you know, and the women, Love that because women were oppressed as well. Mm -hmm. So the Grimke sisters, in a way, maybe it was planned, maybe it was not planned because they themselves were free of their parents and Southern life in the plantation and so forth, and they wanted to see the abolition of slavery. So you know that that moments like that when something changes, I think those are kind of like my favorite historical figures, where they really don't mean to say that, or maybe they meant it to say it, and then it becomes something greater. So well, if you haven't that, seen it, I'm sure you've seen it, um, Salt of the Earth. Yes, yeah, Salt something of the Earth. Something similar yeah. like so that, right? Salt of the Earth. Actually, I want to tell you that I'm also teaching in women's studies. I'm teaching feminist film, and I'm having them compare Salt of the Earth with another film. I wanted to show them uh, when I was talking to, I'll say women of a certain age, um, uh, about this class, they all said, oh, you gotta show Juana Gallo, Juana Gallo. And I said, but Juana Gallo's in Spanish. Some of these students don't speak Spanish or know what's being said in Spanish. And so, uh, and one student recently asked me, too bad we don't have some old films that talk about women being heroes. And I said, there is one, there's Juana uh -huh. Gallo, but you're gonna have to, if you speak Spanish, fine. If not, I don't know what you're gonna do. And anyway. The films are out there, and uh, so you know it's it's uh, but Salt of the Earth, it's a it's a favorite one, and so is Frida. Yes. Yeah, yeah. those are two, two good movies where women play a central role. Right. You were going to say something, do you? Oh, I was going to lead into the last question Go ahead. about peace. Yeah, you know, please. We only have a few minutes left, and uh, how do you see the way you practice f history in this kind of eclectic way? Here's the question. This issue about peace and peace between peoples, peace between, you know, nations or nation states. Men and women. Men and women, peace between <laughs> men and women. How do you see that kind of history, the kind of history you're, you're doing, contributing to creating more peaceful relations? Well, I think the history that I practice is part like social history, labor history, urban history, public history. Yeah. Kind of all at the same time. Uh, in When I was an undergrad, I remember they were telling me in communications, oh, you need to specialize. You need to specialize in, in uh, you know, advertising PR or journalism. And at one point I said, I don't want to specialize. I want to do it all. And they said, you can't do it all. Mm -hmm. You know, no one can do it all. And I said, well, I want to try. Watch me. <laughs> I want to try. And so uh, this road that I've taken from uh, going into you know, communications and then going into librarianship archives, now being a professor, it's like I, I sometimes feel extremely lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents just had a, a second and third grade education in Mexico. My mother had told me, has told me stories that my father wanted to be a professor at a university there was no way he was gonna get there. So, and they died and, uh, and I just thought it was an opportunity, but I also have to thank my wife 
because my wife pushed me yeah. so many times when I thought maybe I could do this instead of be in this program, <laughs> <laughs> right? Or maybe, or they don't understand me. I want to do activism work and, and you know, I mean, it's just, I have so many interests. And I do want to tell you real quickly here, someone approached me on writing. They were looking for a book on peace in mm -hmm. El Paso. And they approached me and they asked, do you know of any books on peace? Has anyone written? And I said, no, but let's write one. Uh -huh. And she says, great, but I mean, it's on my list of things that... It's on your list of things. On my list do. of things that Hopefully I think... Hopefully it's not a bucket list. <laughs> no, 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 it's not a bucket list. And um, I'm, I'm blanking out on her name right now, but she's a pastor. Oh, okay. She's a pastor. She's with the Interfaith Coalition. Uh -huh. And uh, I need to contact her and I say, we need to write that book in peace. That's a great note to end on. Yeah, yeah. so... So. Miguel, it has been such a pleasure. I'm glad you <laughs> said let yes me, to... Let me grasp your hand as well. Thank you okay. very much for joining us. Okay, well, thank you. And thank you again to our team and to our viewers. My name is Kim Diaz. Jules Simon. And uh, join us next time or see some of our other videos on the EPCC TV playlist, Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera. <laughs>